One year ago, the Supreme Court has now overturned Roe v. Wade. It's complete and utter joy that it was finally overturned. It feels like a betrayal. The landmark decision. My body, my choice. Igniting a year of upheaval. Make no mistake about it. If Congress passes a national ban, I will veto it. Uncertainty in women's health care. I ultimately felt like I was either going to end up in jail for saving someone's life, or I was going to watch someone die. And now, the next chapter for a divided nation. New restrictions taking effect. I promised Oklahomans that I would sign every pro-life bill that hit my desk. If you don't believe abortion is a federal issue, you have no business running for federal office. The stakes are incredibly high. And voters weighing in. I'm just overjoyed. We did what Kansas needed us to do. We will not win the popular vote in 24 if we continue down this path of extremism. It's the fallout and the future of abortion in America one year later. This is a Meet the Press special. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from Washington. One year ago, the Supreme Court handed down a momentous decision overturning Roe v. Wade, taking away a right. We've not seen a Supreme Court do this uh, in our lifetimes. And it declared that there is no longer a view of this Supreme Court that there's a constitutional right to abortion in this country. So the ruling effectively moved the decision on the legality of abortion to the states. And it's opened the door for state legislatures to pass laws that limit abortion rights further than on the federal level. And so far in this post-Roe world, Tens of millions of Americans have seen their access to abortion curtailed, depending on where they live. So let's look at the lay of the land here. Right now, abortion remains legal in these 25 states and the District of Columbia. Now, let me go through the ones where there's some uh, where there's some discrepancies. There's 14 states that have essentially banned abortion. This includes the state of Texas, home to nearly 30 million Americans. There is also a six-week ban, a so-called heartbeat law in effect in Georgia. Many people call this a ban, if you will, because most people don't know they're pregnant until perhaps 8, 9, 10, even week 12. Speaking of 12 weeks, that is a 12-week ban was enshrined into law in the state of Nebraska. Now, the, the following eight states on screen now currently have 15 to 20-week bans on the books. You can see there's a big swath of the southeast of this country that is now basically an abortion rights desert. Several states have pending court challenges or laws under dispute. These six states have pending litigation ban bills, if you will, including Florida, which was a longtime safe haven for women in the Caribbean seeking abortion care. And if you see Florida in there twice and you're not, you're a little confused, they've passed a 15-week ban. Then Dobbs happened and pressure came. Then they try to pass a six-week ban. That's the one that's been held up in court if you're keeping score at home. There is also litigation pending over the availability of the widely used abortion pill, including conflicting lower court decisions. Even the U.S. military has not been immune to this upheaval in this post-Roe era. Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tupperville has he currently blocked all military promotions for civilian or military in protest of Defense Department policy that reimburses service members who need to travel out of state for reproductive care because perhaps they're at a base in a U.S. state that bans abortion. Since the Dobbs ruling last year, as voters have gone to the polls all across the country, they're largely voting in one direction, to preserve access to abortion care. By a wide majority, voters in Kansas blocked a referendum last August that would have essentially stricken the right to an abortion from the state's constitution. Nearly 60% of voters sought to preserve abortion access in a state that Donald Trump won by double digits. He got 56% of the vote. Kansas was one of six states that had direct referendums on the issue of abortion in 2022, all of which ended with the pro-abortion access side winning. In the 2022 midterms, only the issue of inflation mattered more to voters than the issue of abortion in nationwide exit polls. 59% said abortion should be legal in all or most cases of those that showed up to the polls uh, in 2022, compared to 36% who said it should be illegal in all or most cases. And public opinion hadn't budged much on abortion, but boy, has it in the last year. In fact, the new Gallup poll has 69% now saying abortion should be legal in the first three months of pregnancy. That is an all-time high. So the decision by the Supreme Court had a boomerang effect, if you will, so far. And the voting trend continued in 2023. We had sky-high turnout for some, frankly, arcane races. There was a special judicial election in Wisconsin. It had a huge turnout because abortion was on the ballot. 
pro-abortion access right judge won. We've got a lot to get into and in how the Supreme Court decision is overturned, overturning Roe is impacting medicine, our politics, our culture, and of course a lot more in this country. So we're going to dig in, particularly on the health care side of things, starting with the upheaval in women's medicine. Here's my colleague, Kristen Dahlgren. Christy Muller and her husband were thrilled when they found out she was pregnant. After multiple miscarriages, they wanted nothing more than a healthy baby. But finding an obstetrician near their Georgia home wasn't easy. The doctor came in without even a barely saying hi, looked at me, looked at my husband and said, oh, you know, you're out of my pay grade and chuckled. And I sat there and I kind of process, what does that mean? Are you really saying this? More than half of the counties in Georgia don't have a single OBGYN. There was a shortage before the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But doctors like Joy Baker worry the state's strict abortion ban is compounding the problem. Anytime we limit access to full scope of care, we are limiting our patients and our practitioners. And when we do that, we, we may not understand the ripple effects. It's not just patients who want an abortion or even pregnant women who are struggling to find care. If I called you today as a new patient for an annual visit, when could you see me? September. That means waiting months for even routine women's care, like breast and cervical cancer screening. In the past year and a half, we've had two people retire and one person who left the community. So while we normally would have six to seven OBGYN serving this West Georgia area, right now we're down to four. Four OBGYNs in a five-county area. Dr. Baker is looking for help, but not having any luck. And a recent survey of almost 500 medical students across the country showed that most were unlikely to apply to a residency program in a state with abortion restrictions. Are you concerned about a pool of upcoming doctors into your state? If they're looking for providing abortions as part of their medical practice, Georgia can be a place they don't apply. State Senator Ed Setzler wrote Georgia's HB 481, which bans abortion with limited exceptions after a heartbeat is detected around six weeks, often well before pregnant patients can get in to see a doctor. When you think about the telemedicine that's available, mm -hmm. you can have a doctor consultation. Um, those are th those are pretty broadly available across the state. But you couldn't have a scan to see if there were issues with the fetus. But I will tell you this, the LIFE Act balances the difficult circumstances. And I think the, the idea that there's ge geographic barriers for certain women in certain communities misses the point that there's a, a living, beating heart and a child that's, that's worthy of protection. This time last year, Dr. Leila Zahidi was practicing maternal fetal medicine in Tennessee. It was, for all intents and purposes, kind of the perfect job for me. It's where we wanted to be long term. But on June 24th, 2022, everything changed. Within weeks, Tennessee had enacted a total ban on abortions, no exception for the life of the mother. The number of patients who I would have to tell, I'm so sorry, this isn't going to result in a live birth for you. And they would sob and say, well, how do I how do I take care of myself? And I'd say in the state of Tennessee, all abortions are illegal. She says she would send patients out of state for care. But eventually, she also left, relocating to Colorado, where she says she didn't have to worry about being prosecuted for what she saw as standard of care. Still leaving her patients behind wasn't easy. I will probably carry the guilt of leaving that community for the rest of my life. And she worries about the longer-term implications to women's health if access to care is squeezed even more. Fear shared by Dr. Baker in Georgia, a state she calls one of the most dangerous places in the developed world to give birth. We know that statistically we're going to see a rise in maternal deaths because of this decision. A stark reality facing the Mullers, who now travel 40 minutes each way to see Dr. Baker twice a month. I was scared that I wouldn't be able to find a doctor who was going to cater to my needs, cater to my baby's needs, and also make sure that both of us was going to make it out of this alive. A mother who wants this baby girl more than anything, scared a safe birth might be caught up in the fight over abortion. Kristen Dahlgren, NBC News, LaGrange, Georgia. So there's the direct impact of the Dodds decision on how many OBGYNs now have to practice medicine. But let's now look to the impact on our culture and politics and what it means for the future of the anti-abortion rights movement 
or as they call themselves, the pro-life movement. Kristen Welker has that report. For half a century, anti-abortion activists were united around a singular goal, overturning Roe v. Wade. Now, one year after the constitutional right to an abortion was struck down, activists in the anti-abortion rights movement are speaking out about the future, including Carol Tobias, president of the National Right to Life Committee. I can't believe how fast this year has gone. So much has, has happened. We're not protecting as many of those unborn children as we would like, but um, we have the opportunities. We have a lot of opportunities ahead of us. And Kristen Hawkins, president of Students for Life of America. I think just for this generation to be able to see this huge seismic shift take place, I don't even think the whole I don't think the cultural change has even yet been measured from just that one decision. While these advocates say they are still united in their primary goal to end abortion services nationwide, there are divisions about how to achieve that aim. If you don't believe abortion is a federal issue, you have no business running for federal office. I think going for any kind of national ban at this stage um, is not possible. Even if you're looking at something like 12 or 15 weeks, uh, there's not the support for that kind of legislation. The divide creating a patchwork of approaches. The challenge now, refining a strategy. It is federal, it is state, and it is community. And that is where we engage, whether it's on campuses, changing hearts and minds, whether it's in the community promoting nonviolent alternatives for families and mothers in crisis, or whether it's here in Washington or a state capital. Real world factors about the impact of abortion restrictions on women's health care pose serious questions. A 2020 study from the Commonwealth Fund, which supports independent research on health care issues, found that in states where abortion is restricted, the maternal death rate was 62 percent higher than in states with access to to abortion care. How does that impact you to hear that figure? I'm appalled that the numbers are as high as they are in the United States. We need to do better, but that does not justify or uh, cannot be used as an excuse to c kill more unborn children. Meanwhile, organizers like Mark Lee Dixon are fighting at the grassroots level. The overturning of Roe v. Wade did not slow down my life just increased it. Dixon, who marched outside the Capitol on January 6th, but who denounced the violence during our interview, says he is appealing to city councils to ban abortions at the local level, hoping to create what he calls sanctuary cities for the unborn. So far, he says he has succeeded in 65 local areas. If an abortion facility moves into a community, it's not their state capital's problem or their nation's capital's problem. It's their problem. When the discussion was thrown to the states that legislators could no longer say we're waiting on the Supreme Court, that the ball was in their court to do something. We pressed him on how he justifies urging city councils to not follow federal and state laws. What do you say to people that's creating chaos and undercuts law enforcement? I don't think it creates chaos at all because the very heart of what these ordinances and laws are being used for. It's to protect innocent human life. Dixon's latest target, Snowflake, Arizona, population 6,300. Abortion is already illegal in Arizona after 15 weeks. It's really a religious community. We all believe in um, the right for life. You know, that they would choose life. And so it's really important that it stays that way. But in other places, Dixon's anti-abortion platform is enraging some residents. In Gallup, New Mexico, where Dixon's proposal is being considered and facing some intense opposition. I went to nursing school before many of you were born, and I saw the results of illegal abortions. People that use coat hangers, people that use toxic chemicals injected into their uteruses. Facing a campaign year when abortion politics will animate voters across the political spectrum. A new test for this movement after it achieved its decades old goal. Searching for a new strategy and seeking new candidates to carry forward this deeply personal and political debate. Kristen Welker, NBC News, Washington. So both Kristen Dahlgren and Kristen Welker setting the backdrop, the impact of this decision, how it's had an impact on the medical community, a little bit on the right side of the aisle, on the politics side. So 
what are we going to focus on next? Well, it's all things 2024. The next post row fight at the ballot box isn't happening next calendar year. It's happening a lot sooner than that. After the break, we're going to head to the state of Ohio, where a surprise summer special election has advocates on both sides of this issue and poll workers scrambling. That's ahead on this Meet the Press special, Abortion in America, One Year Later. And we are back with our Meet the Press special, looking at abortion in America one year later. As we've said, since the Supreme Court overturned Roe last year, some state legislatures have opposed new abortion restrictions, while others have moved to protect abortion rights. And in some places, like Ohio, voters are working to take abortion decisions away from the state house and put it at the ballot box. Here's my colleague Dasha Burns with what's going on in Ohio little mistakes, so I'll go through it with you line by line. The latest front line in the battle over abortion rights now in Ohio. I want to make this a constitutional amendment in our Ohio Constitution that women do have these reproductive choices. Abortion rights activists in the Buckeye State working to get 400,000 voter signatures by July 5th to get an amendment on the ballot in November that would enshrine abortion access in the state constitution. What's on the ballot in November is every Ohioan's access to their own choices on their reproductive care. We're amending the state's constitution because it is something that is long lasting. But first, they'll have to get through Republican legislators in the state house who are aiming to make it harder to amend the state constitution. GOP lawmakers putting a referendum on the books in August aimed at raising the threshold for passing amendments from 50% plus one to 60%, just months after signing a law eliminating most August special elections. The move drawing protests. We are an opposition from a bipartisan group representing Ohio's election officials. We recommended that we do eliminate August elections. How do August special elections compare to a November election? With a low turnout, you're having a limited number segment of the uh, population uh, that is going to get out and vote. <laughs> Critics say that low turnout is the point, making it more likely for the Republican-led proposal to pass in August and less likely for the abortion rights amendment to succeed in November. Secretary of State Frank LaRose acknowledged the connection at a Republican dinner in May. This is 100% about keeping a radical pro-abortion amendment out of our Constitution. Republican Representative Brian Stewart, who championed the August special election, defending the decision. Will this not, though, create a much higher hill to climb for that abortion ballot proposal in November. We believe that most issues like that should go through the legislature. If the legislature gets it wrong, we can fix it. We can fix it in a week. Once you put something in the Constitution, it's generally there to stay. Overall, though, you know, when you live in a democracy, you want as many people as possible to have a say, right? Even if you want to raise that threshold. Well, the here, founders right? disagreed. <laughs> I mean, well, so yeah. you, do you disagree? You don't well, want as many people as possible to have a say? I mean, the founders of the United States of America did not put in a provision to allow there to be outside interest group generated amendments. They wanted there to be a supermajority to the amend the Constitution. The difference between a simple majority and a supermajority could prove pivotal. Polls show 59% of Ohioans support a ballot amendment to make abortion a fundamental right. And in states that have voted to protect abortion access, like Michigan and Kansas, pro-abortion rights movements won by just shy of 60%. Ohio is, you know, the place that this battle is happening right now this year, but this is happening all across the country. It's going to be in so many more states next year during that election cycle. Dasha Burns, NBC News, Columbus, Ohio. All right, let's bring in our political panel here. Uh, Mariana Sotomayor, Washington Post congressional reporter. Stephanie Shriak, senior advisor at the Strategic Victory Fund and a former president of EMILY's List. And a former member of Congress, Republican Barbara Comstock from Northern Virginia. Uh, welcome to all of you. So set us up here, Mariana. Um, Congress, how far away are we from actually having the federal conversation? It feels like we are probably years away from this actually realistically happening on a federal level, are we not? 
Absolutely. I mean, right now, with the Congress that you have, Republicans do not want to talk about this. They just don't. None of them. Moderates. The far right is probably the only group in the House that is ready to force their other Republicans and the House at large to vote on this, which is a dream come true for Democrats, because this is exactly what they want to be running on. Right. They just keep talking about the extremism generally within the party. Right. But you just don't hear this from leaders. They don't want to talk about it. Senate Republicans also don't want to talk about it because right. it is an issue. You know, it's funny, Barbara, you and I got started in politics about the same time. I think the three of us got started <laughs> yeah. in politics about the same time. <laughs> And with Roe v. Wade as the law of the land, Republicans were able to put Democrats on the defensive about when should abortion, your access to abortion stop. Now it is the reverse. When do you expect the Republican Party to have this, okay, we got to have a different conversation about abortion? When do they actually have that conversation? Because I don't think the party's there yet. No, it's not. And, and one of the problems, I think, for Republicans is Trump has hijacked this and the Trump extremism, the election deniers the misogynists have kind of hijacked the issue because I don't think Trump really is pro-life or ever believed in this issue. And so for people who are genuinely pro-life and concerned about winning hearts and minds and care about this issue, I think uh, he has sort of bastardized this issue and causes a lot of problems because he brings the misogyny to the table, the Herschel Walkers, yeah. the people who never really believed in this issue. So I think until after he's out of the picture, it's going to be hard for people really to deal with the issue itself. You can't disaggregate it yet. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, it was always, I think, pro-lifers really thought this needed to go back to the states mm -hmm. and maybe win the hearts and minds of people work together, realize that this was going to be right. a long slog to win the hearts and minds, work with women, do things, you know, at the state level, right. you know, have, you know, work on adoption, work on um, getting women's centers and helping um, women have their babies, work on preventing um, abortion by, you know, I think. You so know, you don't have those uh, troubling statistics that in exactly. places where there's abortion bans, there's worse outcomes for, for and mothers. That we, exactly right. you know, we had problems um, with having more doctors and OBGYNs right. before the Dobbs decision. Yeah. So we need to deal with the medical issues here together, right. whether you're pro-life or pro-choice. Stephanie, I think what Dobbs exposed on the Democratic side was just this sort of it, the the years of decay of of pushing state candidates, right, state legislative candidates, this sort of desert of Democrats in these state legislatures made the passage of these laws go even faster, perhaps, than maybe folks expected. Oh, I think I think that is very true. And it wasn't for lack of groups wanting to do the mm -hmm. local work, it sort of became about lack of resources to do the local work. Well, the right work. did the local our, work. They oh, had the resources they, for it. Absolutely. Yeah. And we sadly didn't for yeah. a long time. And that thankfully has changed. And I'm, I'm glad to see a lot more of that. But we're now two, arguably three, right. congressional redistricting maps away in these legislatures. They are terribly yeah. drawn. It's a huge issue. But if anything's going to swing it, it's going to be something like this, because I'll tell you, women across the country and a lot of men are very concerned and they're going to hear more and more right. terrible health care stories about what's going on with women and their families in their backyard, in their little conservative town. Right. It's going to be like, oh, my gosh, this is a serious issue. Well, we're going to see a lot of court battle sort of residual fallout and we see it already with with mifa pristone that the supreme court's going to have to hear are we ultimately going to resolve this debate at the ballot box or in the courthouse i mean back to your earlier question i think it will be the ballot box but it will take so long republicans would have to get voted out of office possibly this republican majority in the house would probably have to lose their majority they are genuinely worried that this issue will likely cause that because democrats only mm -hmm. need five seats but you also need a significant number of Democrats in the Senate because the last year, House Democrats were able to pass, you know, the codification of yeah. Roe died in the Senate. So you need also a filibuster proof to actually potentially see a lot more of this happening. But there's another thing going on here. It seems like there's not if you if you're not on one side or the other, there's no room for you. Like, and that seems to be a bigger problem right now with uh, what I call pro-choice Republicans, Barbara, than it is for pro-life Democrats. But I think, as we saw in the Virginia primaries, pro-life Democrats lost every competitive primary. Well, I think the thing is, most you know, people are in the middle. 
and the parties Particularly make you this choose. Issue. And there's also, you know, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, people understand, I think you need to compromise. And when you talk to people outside of the party process, right. people say, you, you know, we, we understand you need to compromise on this issue, but the parties won't let you. And because people aren't, you know, the political process is trying to, we have the votes, we're going to do right. a total ban, or we have the votes, we're going to have nine months and not do anything. Whereas in the real world, people would rather people work together. I recently was at a great event that my friend who at Virginia Kids mm -hmm. Belong, pro-life, pro-choice, uh, Janet Kelly in Virginia, brought women together to say, how can we help mm -hmm. uh, kids who are foster care kids? She helped a woman who needed, uh, she started the program because right. a woman who was going to get an abortion decided to have her child. And, and so now everyone works together. We need, but women that's in one work place, me. but then you've right. got yeah. a governor in Virginia who's right. waiting for the bill to come to his desk to limit abortion access and health care for women. No, and I, and I, so I think we really it needs to so slow down. Far and away. I think women want it to slow Except down. They've got to vote, out these, this, we've got there, to vote out these, elect, is, yeah. these, these folks, though. They've but, got and, to and now, Do you think there's room in the Democratic? party anymore for some restrictions or not right now i would say not right now because right now what we're looking at i mean i would say is 24 really important yeah if things go south for some reason for the democrats and we have a fully republican congress with a republican president you don't think there's going to be a national abortion ban vote i absolutely believe there is and it's because there is enough in special interest group pressure that is pushing do right. you think every presidential candidate is going to commit to signing a national abortion ban on the Republican side? Oh, I think they are. And well, I think that, if they do, yeah. that will hurt them. That's going to be fascinating because it does become almost too definitional for each right. party. All right. Mariana, Stephanie, Barbara, good to see you all. Thank you for this conversation. And thank you all for joining us for this Meet the Press special, Abortion in America, One Year Later. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.